Look what I found. Anyway, the man in all his glory. Who was that guy? That brother was the best damn soldier that ever lived. I'm going to start with this film because basically I loved how you began it the same way you began Black Klansman and had the film sort of bookend with historical footage. And I was wondering what were your choices on what footage you wanted to use with that? Was that something already in the script and like how you chose those particular words from those particular men to sort of, I think, heighten what the, the film was trying to say? It's historical footage, you know? So I have a great researcher, her name is Judy A. Lee, been working with me for many, many years and she finds everything. And so we make the choice in the editing room what we're gonna use. But to give you a better answer, I knew I wanted to have, as you, as you, you used the word uh, bookends, I wanted the two individuals in the prologue and epilogue be two people who are vocal about early, when it wasn't popular about the Vietnam War, the, the, how immoral the war was. Muhammad Ali, very famous statement, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger. He's, he had great sacrifice, lost the prime, his prime years as a boxer, stripped of his heavyweight champion. And then the epilogue with Dr. Martin Luther King, who also paid a price, I think, that's why I got assassinated. He wasn't about talking about black people, you know, getting to eat it counters with white folks. You know, he's talking about the power structure. He's talking about war. War is an economy. War is a business. Dow Chemical, Napalm, Agent Orange. He was messing with the money. Yeah. Plus, I think that LBJ was feeling different about him. He thought he had an ally, an ally with the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But when he saw Dr. King step out and say the world, the, this Vietnam War is immoral. Changed yeah. everything. It changed everything. No, it's amazing. And in a lot of ways, Muhammad Ali was the Colin Kaepernick of that era and had the same penalty. It's so funny how history repeats itself. Yeah. Bringing it back to the film, though, I wanted to talk about Kim Coleman is your longtime casting director, and I love her. I've gotten to chat with her a couple times. She's, I did one of the few interviews she ever allows anyone to do. Uh, but she is so great at finding young talent. I mean, you know, she cast, you know, Anthony and She Hate Me and she cast Tiana and like Chirac. But this one, you guys got Jonathan. Did you know Jonathan Majors before? Did she bring him into you? How did she bring him I, and how did I, she- I knew, I heard of him, but Kim, she was like, you gotta see this guy's work. I said, all right, because you know, Kim's not gonna steer me wrong. Well, I wasn't gonna make him read, you know, you know, just, yeah. just eat and, you know, sit down and, you know, vibe. But uh, Kim was not wrong. She had, she had me wrong with me so far. So uh, thank you, Kim Coleman. We bury it. They don't, we come back and collect. Don't worry, I'm gonna start with you, but I wanna ask both of you. Why do you think the Vietnam War is something that, like, cinematically we want to revisit like why does it always seem so i would say topical and why is it i guess something that people like to look back on from a movie standpoint and i'll start with you delroy because i think it's unfinished business and i think it's unfinished business from the standpoint and when i say unfinished yes that the conflict came to an end but psychically it's unfinished business because it goes against the american creed of we are the shit. When we take care of something, we take care of it. And it goes ag expressly against that creed because it did not get taken care of. Um, in, in fact, the exact opposite. So I think that it, it, it is a bone that sticks in the craw of the culture. In addition to which, there is the unfinished business of how human beings were mistreated. 
the thousands and thousands of young men who were drafted against their will, the thousands and thousands of young men who came back and were mistreated, uh, the thousands of young men that the country turned its back on at the time, all of that, as far as I can see, constitute unfinished business, things that need to be readdressed, that need to be readdressed, and, and if not made right, they need to be readdressed and reexamined. So I think that may be um, that may be part of the reason for the continued fascination with um, this 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 conflict, which has created a conflict inside the culture. Mm. Wow, that's a great way of saying it, Jonathan. Um, this may be controversial, but America does not like to lose. That's right. Nor does she like to be stained. I, I liken the Vietnam War and the canon of films to that of antebellum and slave narratives that are told. And they're usually told by the same um, demographic um, and usually told the same amount of tone. And there is a very clear, in my opinion, agenda, which is to cover up or to uh, ratify something that is actually permanent. Yeah, so <laughs> that's why I think uh, uh, we, we keep going back to it. And there's a voyeuristic quality to it because nobody knows what actually happened. What we do know is that slavery was wrong, right? It was fucked up. You can't change it. In the Vietnam War, we had no business being that. Period. So we know that, right? These things are wrong, inherently, morally wrong. Economically, that's where it gets hairy. But that's, we were, we were, we were wrong in that, right? And so we, we, you know, it's just, you know, you go back to your vomit. No, it's a very good, um, so, so well I did not know I was going to say it like that, but that's how it No, y'all oh. both put it so well. Yeah, we both um, similar. Our yeah. answers were similar. Um, um, yeah, I'm sorry, and I, I I will not take from your time, but it, it's it's all, it it comes from the same, I don't know ethos. I don't know. I'm not sure if that's the word. The, this continuing fascination with Marilyn Monroe. Mm. Why why is there this fascination with Marilyn Monroe? Um, Dorothy Dandridge doesn't get the same kind of, um, and they were both tragic American stories, but somehow there is this continuing to go back. Um, to examine it and re-examine it and re-examine it some more. We got how many Marilyn Monroe movies and we got one movie on TV for Dorothy Dandridge. That says it right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure I get this in before I have to get out of here. Both of you are working with Spike in a totally different way. Delroy, you have decades of history with Spike, both as a collaborator and then also just as a friend. And then Jonathan, this is the first film you've did, done with him. And I'm just wondering... How is that different? Because Jonathan stepping on that set, Spike works with the same people over and over and over again. So there's a, like a complete family aspect. And then Delroy, what was it like for you coming back after a certain period of time? And, and so I'll just let you both take one of each. So Jonathan and Delroy. Go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I mean, coming in, it's like, um, you know, I played sports coming, coming up, you know, and it's like uh, you get put on a select team. You know, you work in a certain district, you play for a certain uh, area, right? And then if you're lucky, you get put on a certain select team. And that select team has one coach. And that coach is selected because of uh, what he or she is capable of doing, what they've done. Uh, so being, being picked, you know, being picked to be on this team um, and to work with this coach and to be thrown the ball from these ball players, you know, was a huge... Uh, the huge shift, you know, it was a huge like, okay, I'm here now. And what Spike did, and I think what permeated throughout the cast is that everyone was there for a reason. Amen. You know, I, felt, I felt, I I mean, look, I know who Delroy Lindo is. You know what I'm saying? I know who he is. I, I know the filmography, right? But he was on the team, and that was the great equalizer. We were all on set. And if you were on set, you were here to play ball. That's you know? right. And the coach put you here. So that's right. Lace up and let's go. That, that was if, if, the coach, if the coach put you here, you're supposed to be here. Right. If the coach put you here, you know, because if you weren't um, uh, supposed to be here, the coach would not have put you there um, all day long. Yeah. Um, um, 
coming back felt like um, after 20 plus years, just it felt as appropriate and right as it ever did. Uh, I auditioned for Malcolm X um, and he selected me. He put me on the team. Um, that's the last time I've auditioned for Spike Lee or maybe anything, but certainly for Spike Lee. He offered me crooked. Okay, big dog. Okay, big dog. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm making my point, home. Come on now. I'm making a point, bro. Come on now. Um, he, he, no, my point is he selected me. He put me on the team in, in Crooklyn. He put me on the team in Clockers. He didn't say, uh, okay, you have to pass this test to get on the team. He said, I want you on the team. And after all these years, he's now coming back to me after all these years and saying, I want you on the team. So affirmation after affirmation after affirmation. What more could I ask for as, as an actor? The, this is why one became an actor, to have these kinds of extraordinary relationships with one's fellow workers. I get, I got, I got asked to be on the team. So Jonathan Majors, that was my point, bro. Come on now. Look what I found. Anyway, Dirty man in all his glory. Who was that guy? That brother was the best damn soldier that ever lived. I wanted to start with, um, well, basically, I've been asking everyone this because it seems that although this is maybe one of the first movies of this time period that centers on all black characters, the Vietnam War is something that keeps getting revisited in movies and television. And I was wondering if each of you could maybe tell me why you think it's something that folks keep going back to. And Clark, I'll start with you and then Norman and we'll go around. I think they keep going back to it because it was such a controversial, uh, it came up at such a controversial time in America's history. The civil rights movement was going on at the same time as we were going into Vietnam. And that may have been one of the reasons why Dr. King um, was uh, brought to an end because his focus shifted from the civil rights movement to something that America was dealing with. The other thing is that this is the first time that you're seeing the stories of the black experience in Vietnam, which since Vietnam was never focused on. You know, so again, a very, a very important reason for it for his, for it to be. I think that's your question. Was that right? No, that's perfect. Thank you. And then Norman, if you have, if you have anything. Well, just to add on top of that, and actually <clears throat> I got a history lesson while we've been doing a lot of these uh, interviews. Uh, we were at that time, 11% of the population of the United States, but yet 33% of the population of the uh, army. So it was interesting of how there were so many blacks being sent over to fight for this war and yet we were still fighting for our rights at home. And uh, it was, it's, yeah. Uh, mm. I hope I answered the question, yeah. No, that's perfect. You said, you know, we keep going back to it. I, I don't think so, because I don't think we've ever told this story. This, you know, we've never, we've never gone to it. Uh, even in the documentaries uh, that, I, that I watched, uh, and I watched about three different sets, uh, we never went to, uh, the black experience in Vietnam, even though we were, it was a disproportionate amount of African Americans who were there. Uh, that's a huge chunk to leave out. So I, I like the fact that we can finally get that out there and we can uh, show people that uh, we were represented there and a lot of people died there. And it was, it was interesting too, just to add on to that. We had a lesson while we were over there uh, learning about that culture. We, there were films that we saw, videotapes that we, or d DVDs that we saw about the black culture and learning how to recognize each other by doing the DAP. And there were certain ways to uh, recognize different people from different platoons. Um, and it became such a, a thing that a lot of the white superiors would put people in jail for doing that. It's interesting, you guys have all worked with Spike in some way. He's such a, a huge icon in film and everybody I think is intrigued by his filmmaking. What would folks be surprised is something that is essential to working with Spike Lee on set that maybe they wouldn't think about from either the way that he directs or the atmosphere he puts forth? I gotta think about what I have to say. I don't wanna... <laughs> <laughs> so, work again. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I keep working with Spike, you know? <laughs> no, it, it's, uh, <clears throat> when we look at Spike Lee's films, <clears throat> we think that 
you know, I mean, and he does have this incredible vision as to what he wants. But I think a lot of people don't give him credit for the flexibility that he has, uh, that uh, flexibility that he allows uh, actors to work within that mold. So, so Spike is going to get his shot, but he's also going to let you get your shot. And you, you have the ability to work within that. Uh, uh, and that's kind of liberating for an actor. That's kind of freeing for, for an actor. It's not as rigid as, as it sometimes ha has a tendency to look. I mean, the shot is going to be there and usually the shot is brilliant, but uh, you do have a little bit of freedom. Uh, uh, and I think that's very important. And I think that's where you get the camaraderie and the believability in his films because you, you as an actor you're allowed to do that just to piggyback on top of that yeah he knows what he wants when he wants it he has a structure that he wants but yet within that sometimes he'll see something different because there's going to be a different energy that uh for that we've didn't have like in the rehearsal process and then while we're in the scene all of a sudden oh say that line or how would you say that because there's a couple of times uh he asked isaiah and myself like, okay, don't say those lines, but what would you say in this moment? And so it was kind of like, he, like uh, Isaiah was saying, it was freeing and, and liberating and exciting, but yet you knew you were in this structure and you, you felt safe in this, in this structure. Because after a while you start doing it without him telling you, right. just because you, you have that freedom and you know that uh, you can just kind of let yourself go. I mean, that's the beauty, uh, and, and magic starts to happen in those films when you're about to do that. Yeah. And uh, Clark, real quick before they kick me out of here. <laughs> All right, you know, uh, exactly. is that, is that uh, a spike? Is that it? Okay, that's okay. I'm sorry, Clark, I wanted to get you to answer the question, but both of you guys were great, so I'm gonna loves get the party. out of here. He loves the party, that's what I was gonna say, he loves the party. Hey, get, 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 get